Uh, and we have a very special guest today. We are joined with Ryan Serhunt, who is the founder and CEO of Serhunt, three-time best-selling author, your investor in Realty Capital. Uh, Ryan, how's it going? Good. I'm just I'm looking at my caption. I'm like, did I type that? Because I didn't type that just now. Founder of all real estates. Dude, this is this is all you. Did we? I don't think no, we did I, that. I, I do not just. <laughs> Maybe the last time I did a I did a stream, yeah. I don't know, but that's maybe, hilarious. Maybe yeah, clearly you moonlighted. Or my the team of all, set it up. That's yeah, pretty funny. All so real funny. estates, but um, super excited for everyone tuning in. Would love to know. Type into chat where you're tuning in from. Ryan, I'm guessing you're you're in New York. I am. Yeah, I'm in my office. I'm in Soho. I'm on West Broadway right now. It's like finally sunny. It's warm out. It's great. That's awesome. awesome. Yeah. I. Uh, Great. Yeah. And can see everyone here. You can see us. We've got people from uh, NYC. Sarah says, love the wall. Uh, someone from uh, Manitoba, another Canuck. Uh, amazing. Well, nice. I think we can just dig into this. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions. And for those of you that are watching the session, as we're going through this, we'll have time at the end for any audience questions. So please type them into the chat. We will bring them up at the end. Um, but Ryan, I think just like for us to start, um, would love just to take a step back as the earlier part of your career, um, because I have to say, I think when you started, originally you wanted to be an actor, and then you decided to go into real estate in 2008, and I'm pretty sure, correct me if I'm wrong, it was like literally when the Lehman Brothers were collapsing. Um, yeah, that day, actually. Oh, geez. What was the environment like, like when you first started in real estate? Uh, I think for everybody who was in the real estate business in 2008, I think September was a slow motion car crash. In hindsight, September 15th, 2008 kicked off the quote unquote great recession, right? The subprime mortgage collapse. But it had started that spring with the fall of Bear Stearns. There was like, you know, there's there was a lot of other mortgage banks that were failing. So people knew. But then the Lehman Brothers one was oh my goodness, that's that's a real big bank that that's failing. Um, so I think for everybody else, it was a slow motion car crash and people started getting out of the business because people stopped buying, right? They stopped buying, they stopped selling, the market became frozen, right? In pure fear. Um, uh, in 2009 and 2010, it just became very difficult to get a loan. So it was difficult to buy and it was a tricky market to do business in. And that's the business that I learned in. But for me in 2008, I mean, I I, grad I went to Hamilton College in upstate New York. I graduated. I came to New York in the summer of 2006, uh, got a one bedroom, converted it to a three bedroom with two roommates, had a had a fake UPS guy deliver a fake box and then steal all our laptops the first week. I'll never forget that. It's like, welcome to New York. Um, and I spent two years trying to trying to do theater, trying to be an actor. That's what I, that's what I trained for my whole life. Um, but they never trained me how to sell myself as an actor. They never trained me how to make money. I just, I just knew how to be a tree and an old man, you know, um, and sing and dance. And so I didn't make any money. And so I ran out of money and instead of getting a survival job, I got my real estate license because it's the same thing, like learning how to do improv, say yes, and talk to strangers, breathe, listen to respond. It, that is sales. Right? It's creating unique relationships. I'm now just doing it around apartments and townhouses and homes instead of doing it on a stage somewhere. Um, and so I just thought real estate was the hardest thing ever. Like I, I had no context. I yeah. just thought, wow, man, people lose their jobs a lot. Like I would get a client, you know, who'd work at like Deutsche Bank or Chase or anywhere. And, and they'd be, I'd show them apartments for a couple days and then they get fired. <laughs> it's like, man, New York is cutthroat. Obviously there were bigger things going on, but I just, you know, I don't know. I was 24 and like, it wasn't, wasn't really top of my mind, but yeah, that's when I started. Nice. Great time in hindsight, actually. Well, I feel like it's interesting because we, we see people who start businesses when times are let's say like quote unquote easy versus when times are very difficult. And I, I feel like there's certain things that you probably had to learn very early on um, that yeah. maybe people don't realize that you, you do if they're meeting you like for the first time, like your, your follow-up and your persistency. Um, I'm, I'm curious to dig into, cause I think it was one of your, your first client that you met like way back. I think it was like the pregnant woman in Whole Foods or something. Um, mm. But you followed up with her. I think it was like 10 for 10 years, like you didn't hear anything back from her. Um, what is your approach to follow up that doesn't feel annoying or spammy? Because I can't imagine someone staying on your list for 10 years without being like, yo, um, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you put it like that, I sound like a lunatic. 
So, um, uh, you know, I, I, I said, I work for free. There's no salary for real estate agents. Like there's no benefits. Like, you can complain all you want about sizes of commissions, but less than 1% of all real estate agents make a livable wage. So like it's, it's like the average real estate agent in New York city alone makes $36,000 a year. You can't, you can't even live in New York city on that. So, um, uh, so your job becomes the hustle, right? Unless the industry wants to change the market and, and turn real estate agents into hourly wage, you know, and we'll just become lawyers, I guess, and just bill everybody for every thought and every phone call, but no one wants to do that. Right. People just want to pay only when we're successful. And so, um, uh, my secret sauce early on, cause I'm not from New York. I'm not from New York. I came here to do theater. My family's in Colorado and Texas and, I um, uh, uh, so I just knew that anytime I met somebody, um, I was going to follow up with them until they, until you buy or die. That's it. And if you tell me to stop following up, then I will stop following up. And I always followed up with value. That was like one of the key things early on. I never say, are you alive? I never say just checking in. That stuff is awful. That's like going to a shoe store and having someone say to you, Hey, need anything? Need any help? No, that's why I buy stuff online. Stop talking to me. Like no one, people hate being sold, but they love shopping with friends, right? Um, and so that woman, it wasn't 10 years, um, although I am still following up with people right now who I met in 2009 who still have not replied. And one day they will, I promise. Yeah. Um, I, I hope, unless they I, died. I, I, don't think, I think that's how we first met, by the way. Ryan DM'd me on Instagram asking if I'm trying to buy a house. And I remember at the time, I think you still are using Thinkific, which was a competitor. I used to run a company called Teachable for online course training. Yes. And I was like, yes. maybe if you switch to your course platform, we'll talk. But yeah, you yes. know, the hustle even even then. Yeah, but there was a there was a there was a woman um, uh, on the Upper East Side, and I showed her apartments for about a year, and then she disappeared on me for four years. And I followed up from 2012 to 2017, and then her husband. Mm -hmm followed up with me, said they got divorced and said he wanted to buy something. And I sold him a place for $16 million. Um, and I would never have done that had I not followed up. Like that's one of my first, one of my first big deals ever, like north of 5 million bucks was early on in 2010 when a guy emailed us and said he was interested in buying an apartment that we had listed that was listed for eight and a half million dollars. And it wasn't, it wasn't worth eight and a half. And I was broker number five because the seller was a crazy person. Okay. And it was worth probably five. And this person emailed and said they wanted to buy it. And I said, sure. How much? Um, and they had a thick accent and they were like 8.3. And I told the seller, and they're like, great, we'll take it. And then the guy totally disappeared. And it took me a year to track that person down. Everyone said it was a con. It was a scam. I flew to Paris to find the person, got him to sign an application. He was real, but he just tried to get me to drink a lot. So I was like, this is going to be my taken moment. And my dad is not that cool. Um, <laughs> and so, it, it, but anyway, but he eventually closed and the guy makes, turns out he was real. And one night he was just drunk on the internet, looking at listings in New York city. And he responded and there was a super persistent white kid. That was me who followed up with him and he bought it because he felt bad for me. And I was like, I don't care how you feel. I'm just glad we closed. Um, and that's been a strong relationship ever since. And I nearly died doing that one. So, you know, you've got to hustle. You got to follow up all the time and follow up with value. So new listings for me, right? In my business, anyway, new listings, new closings, market information and opinions. I tell every salesperson, no matter what you sell, your job is to have perspective. Mm -hmm. Your job is to have an opinion. No one cares about anything other than your opinion. Why do you think people watch TikTok? Why do you think people still watch the news? They could get the news a thousand different ways, but they watch it for his opinion, right? They watch it for the perspective so that that could help you form your own perspective, right? Educate me based on what you think about the news. And that's also how we get fake news. <laughs> that's how we also get the wrong news. But um, as a salesperson, that's important. You follow up with value. Eventually, that person will decide it's time to buy whatever it is you're selling and you have to be front of mind because it is not the customer's job to remember you. It's your job to be front of mind. Yep. Uh, just one second. There's people waiting for you to open a, a zoom room for our office hours. I'll take the next question while, while she does that. But okay. have you, have you found any of this to like change? I mean, you've now been doing this for a while, right? It's like closing yeah. in on 15 years. 
have has the has the game changed or or do you think it's the sort of thing like you know an old book where it's it's always going to be the same well the game is changing now the national association of realtors just settled a class action lawsuit for over 400 million dollars that. that'll change the way um it, it'll on paper it'll change the way that real estate agents work with buyers in real life that's how it already is in most of the rest of the world and nothing changes Sellers mm -hmm. still want to sell. Sellers will still offer buyers compensation, but there's just added paperwork and added disclosures. Um, and so that'll be fine. So there's there's change there. I think there's change with AI. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think AI replaces real estate agents because it's still such a human business, a person to person business. And I haven't seen AI figure out how to open up a busted lockbox. Um, and when they can do that, then game over for sure. Yeah. So maybe Elon Musk will figure that one out. Um, but I think, I think, you know, the the process of working with customers, given the new commission law changes mm -hmm. and the process of using artificial intelligence and large action models to anticipate your next action, I mm -hmm. think will really, really, really revolutionize the way salespeople do administrative tasks, you know, and give them more of their time back. Mm -hmm. And but the actual act, the, you know, like actually selling and, and all of that, I mean, you think those principles are basically timeless in a lot of ways? Honestly, I, I like I keep thinking that we're going to get replaced tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, I, I keep like it's if it were to happen tomorrow, it would not surprise me. Um, and yet everything that gets created to replace salespeople only ends up empowering them even further. Right. Like I remember mm -hmm. when like eTrade.com came out. JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank were shaking in their boots, game over for investment mm -hmm. bankers and traders. Yep. Humans can now do it on their own. Turns out that human beings are mostly uneducated when it comes to spending money and investing yep. dollars. And also they have jobs. And so, yeah, this is good for some people. But what it ended up doing was it created a retail trading environment that added more liquidity to the market mm -hmm. for your institutional yep. investors to invest with. So like yep. it, it's and Robin Hood then took that and multiplied that even further. Yeah. And now there's now there's more investment bankers than ever before yeah. in the history yeah. of the planet. So yeah, like I I actually think that, you know, and, and how you and I first got created, mm -hmm. uh, created, uh, connected, you know, we we started uh, I started doing sales training for real estate people only. Mm -hmm. I could not find good sales training, like sales training that wasn't gross and spammy, but like real sales training that would enable salespeople to like be better for their clients and sell more and make more money and actually like have structure. And there's no school mm -hmm. of all the universities in the United States alone. Four of them have a sales course. Four, wow. Right. And so I guess San Cardone training, is not a is not a university, but we'll get your thoughts on, on that another time. The sales training is looked down on. It's like yeah. this thing. People are like, oh, I don't need. But then everybody has to do it. Uh, yeah. You could be a software engineer, but if no one buys your software, you just built it for your mom. Mm -hmm. So like I, I, so we created Sell It Like Sirhand. I did it. I wrote a book about it. We, we created a TV show for Bravo and it blew up. And not just in real estate, like. Uh, lots of industries. And on this coming Tuesday, we're rebranding um, uh, because it's gotten too big to sell it.com. Mm -hmm. And I honestly think that sales skills will be the skill set of the next economy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you started seeing in 2018, 2018 was the convex of high school graduates mm -hmm. not enrolling in college and U.S. taxpayers filing 1099s. Mm -hmm. Like those two yep. graphs converged in 2018, pre-COVID. Yep. You know this better than anybody. So. Yeah, that's why that's why we exist. But yeah, no, absolutely, fully, fully believe that. Do you, I, I guess you kind of brought it up, right? You went from sell it like Sarhan to sell it. Right now, a lot of your business eventually became your brand. It grew, it's continued to grow. How do you think about building an organization that can go above and beyond, you know, basically you putting in the time and inputs yourself? Yep. Uh, I lead by example and I, and I lead by template more than anything. And I guess what I mean by that is, you know, when I first started our company, so I was a real estate agent from 2008 to 2020. I did a TV show called Million Dollar Listing. I did sell like Surhan. I wrote a couple books and the education and all that stuff. And then in 2020, I started my own company, called it Surhant. We do real estate brokerage across marketplaces, education and production. So we have a studio. Um, uh, and one of the concerns I had was if I name it after myself and it's all about me, how do I scale me? 
how do we scale personal brand? Like I know how to build a personal brand, but how do I, how do I really, really scale it? And I got a lot of pushback from people who said, well, you're, you don't really fit a mold, right? You gotta fit a mold. What, what, what kind of company are you? And, mm-hmm. and what I, 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 it's a really, really hard question for me to answer. I was like, you know what? I don't, I don't know if great companies fit molds. I, I think maybe they pour new ones. And, um, uh, and I think the, the world of the creator, as we're seeing right now, right? The influence of the thought leader CEO is only getting stronger. You're now seeing public company CEOs starting videos and LinkedIn blogs. And you're like, oh, wow, what a genius idea. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, my ability to build a mold around a real human who wakes up before you do and goes to bed after you do uh, for you to be inspired by, given how many other jobs you could potentially have or people you could work for, um, uh, has become a huge part of our scalability, right? Mm-hmm. And, and because most of our competition uh, are run by professional fundraisers or cost cutters, and, and that's not me. Right. Like I'm in it with them all day, every day across the businesses. And um, uh, I feel very, very strongly about the movement that we have started outside of just the business. Something that I also think is really interesting that you've done is and I don't know if you guys were the the first to do this um, on the East Coast, but you have, I, I think, an entire like separate production company for creating content, um, not just yep. for you, but for your, your agents as well. Um, yep. What is your approach because I think like when people think of social media, it's like, okay, just putting a video of like, here's a listing that I have, or like, hey, nice to meet you. This is me or whatever. Um, but I feel like you have like a, a slightly different approach to how you actually craft content. Um, so yeah, curious to dig into that. Yeah, we post with purpose. Otherwise, otherwise, why do it? Like, I'm not trying to sell a toaster. So, you know, we built a production company called Studios that creates original IP, it does licensing, it does branding deals, um, it creates content for me, sure, but it also really creates significant content for real estate developers, uh, real estate owners, and the salespeople who work with us. So they are very, very busy, it's a lot. Um, and everything we do is with purpose and with voice and with perspective, right? Um, uh, we think a lot about our differentiated value for your attention. Like there's so many places that you could spend your time right now on your phone, on your laptop, on your TV, everywhere. Why on earth would you watch this video that we just created? What's what's different about it? What's interesting about it? How's it going to stop you in your tracks and not scroll away? How do I keep you for longer than 3.2 seconds? Um, and that posting with purpose, with clear CTAs, right? Clear call to actions is is a like is our battle cry down there. Um, I say down there because studios uh, is in our basement of, uh, of our office on, in Soho. Although if I called it a basement in front of them, they get angry. We call it the lower Laval. And um, uh, uh, and so that's kind of around the ethos. And they've been able to win, a, they've won a lot of shorty awards and all the digital awards now for content and real estate and really building HGTV for Gen Z, right? Like Gen Z doesn't have TV. They don't know what cable is. They'll can never Gen, know. Can Gen Z afford a house though? Or are we, are we not going there? <laughs> you, you know what? They, they can, they just choose yeah. not to. <laughs> yeah. Right. They, they'd rather live at home than go spend money because they want to spend that money on other stuff, like on material goods, on Instagrammable vacations. Uh, that is a whole separate conversation. Whole separate. Yes, they can. <laughs> How much do you change your process? And I know you talk about this a little bit in your sales training based on the buyer persona. Like how much, how differently do you sell based on how you sort of classify or identify the buyer? Um, The sales process is an improv, right? So we have our principles, we have our business plans, we have the process in which we work. Like if we're working with a buyer, we have the same process with how we send them listings, how we talk to them. But I think the most successful salespeople also meet the client where the client is. I think it's pretty ignorant for us to say, hey, this is how we do things. Let us know if you want to work with us. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like you'll get maybe 20% of the business that way. Mm-hmm. I have older clients who only do things over the phone. Mm-hmm. That's it. Everything. I have clients who are only on text. Send them an email. It goes into an abyss. I have no idea how they live their life. I don't yeah. know. 
I have other clients who really just like using our systems and because there's internal chat and you can go through and they're very, very tech savvy. And so we meet our clients where they are to provide the same level of service because that strong level of service creates reputation. That reputation creates brand perception and that perception over time creates the brand, right? Which is at the end of the day, wow, that company is the best, right? If you want the best service, if you want to work with the best people, go work with that company because I'm a crazy person and they dealt with me and they got my deal done, yada, yada, yada. So I just want to dig into that a little bit because uh, when it comes to actually dealing with clients or people face-to-face -face or in person, uh, when you meet someone, because like everyone has a different personality, everyone resonates with like a different type of person. Like, are there certain things when you meet someone for the first time that you're like, okay, these are the things that I'm assessing, like certain things that they say, like likes, dislikes, um, like how do you kind of scan when you meet someone for the first time to see like, this is how I think I need to uh, approach this. So every person I meet, and this is gonna be weird now if I meet anyone who's on here, because now you'll know. I, I just, I always just use the two C's. So the first thing you do is you give someone a compliment that immediately disarms them. Okay. And it, it's authentic. If you have no compliment, don't give it right. This is just advice and it works. So you give them a compliment and usually it's something superficial. Like it's about the dress or hair, or if you know them or you're able to Google them beforehand about their business, their success, something or other. People like compliments and they like talking about themselves. Okay. So that's the first thing you do. And then you find the thing in common. So, hey, online education, we have that in common. Hey, real estate, we have that in common. Hey, you are also wearing Stan Smith's. I have those too. That's something in common, whatever it might be. Um, and then from there, you start asking questions. So what you'll teach to salespeople is you'll teach a funnel technique. So you start with the biggest questions and then you narrow it down, but you do it on purpose. Otherwise a conversation could be a waste of time. Every minute is valuable. So how, how do you have productive conversations? Um, and the funnel technique is, is, is the way to do that. And you can learn really quickly. Is this a person for you? Is this a person not for you? Is this person a great potential client? Could they be hot, warm, or cold? How do you think about them that way? And maybe I just have a sales disease and this is how I think. And maybe all of my relationships are messed up because of it. I'm totally fine with that. I don't care. Um, but that's how I do it. And that's, that's how it works. So I can determine like, what is what is my relationship going to be like with this person? Um, a lot of times it's like, eh, nothing, <laughs> nothing. Mm -hmm. I'll see you around. Not, nothing here. But sometimes it's OK. There's value here. Let me make sure that I stay on top of you. Right. If you're younger, what's your what's your Instagram handle? I, I'd love to follow you. You're super awesome. Right. If they're a little bit older, how do I stay in touch with you? What's your email? Right. If they're much, much older, do you have a telephone? Um, how can I fax you? Yeah, that's fair. Like, it's nice just to break that down, though, um, because I think like you'll see people that are just naturally like great at connecting with people. And you're just like, oh, it's just like a, a natural skill set rather than having like a, a framework that people can keep in mind. Um, now, I, I want to transition because there's some really great questions. Sorry to cut you off. But like the any networking event, any bar, any airplane, anywhere, all you have to do is ask questions. Where are you from? top of the funnel, right? Where are you from? Where'd you get those shoes? They're awesome. Super simple question. Just memorize five of them. It's one of those five is always going to work, right? That, that's, that's how you start a conversation and just let the other person talk and then listen to respond instead of just listening to reply and see what you can create. That's how the greatest relationships in the world are created, right? Like think about it, your spouse, your best friend, before the day you met them, they were a total stranger. That's awesome. Uh, now, just uh, just for those of you that are watching, tons of great questions in the chat. We probably won't get to to all of them, um, but there's one I'm going to call out first, which is, and also if you see any that you want to answer, feel free to jump in. Uh, but from Raj, who's wondering, how do you spot the best investment in real estate? What are the top or key factors? So that's a loaded question. Depends on your look, if you're looking for a, a residential real estate investment or a commercial real estate investment, let's just say it's relatively general, right? Um, uh, I mean, the first thing you're going to look for is price compared to value, right? Matched with highest and best use. So what is the price? Okay. How does that comp? 
right? So that's what you're understanding. If it's a $5 million building surrounded by million dollar buildings, why is it five? And is that a good deal? Maybe not, maybe it is, I don't know, right? If it's a million dollar building surrounded by $5 million buildings, that might sound like a really, really great deal. Oh my goodness, but maybe it's too cheap for a reason. So what is the price, All right? Against comparables, um, against the value. So, you know, is it a value add property, right? Is it something that you have to tear down to the bones? Maybe it's only a million bucks because it is falling in on itself and the zoning was just changed and you can't actually rebuild here without going through a one year approval process with the city. If you don't know that, that's about to be a really bad purchase for you, right? So there's a lot of information uh, uh, against that value. And then you're figuring out what the highest and best use is. Some of the greatest real estate investments ever made, the purchaser determined that the highest and best use was not what it was being sold as, right? So for example, it's an apartment building, but the purchaser understands that through zoning, they can turn it into industrial, let's say. Very hard to do that, but if you can, now all of a sudden you've got warehouse space for NVIDIA servers with everything that's going on right now. You know how much, you know how much server space costs? You will make so much more money with an industrial warehouse than you ever would with like a 20 unit rental building you know, especially with fixed rent, depends on what state you're in too, right? If you're in New York or California, you know, God bless you. You know, if you're in Florida or Texas, Tennessee, Kentucky, right? You can make a significant amount of money as a real estate investor. So those are the three things you look for. And then you have like, those are objective, right? And then you have subjective elements that you look for, like legal light and air. So if you're looking at, let's say, buying an apartment as an investment, okay? Um, it might look like a good deal, but it's also on the third floor, half facing a brick wall. That will always be a tough sell, even to you. Is that deal really, really good? And trophy assets always trade for trophy prices. You know, like Dan Ott's penthouse at 220 Central Park South. He bought it for $90 million. Insane. All the press, crazy, stupid. And he sold it for 188. So trophy how like how big sport. was that how how big was that that penthouse not big like, like twelve thousand square feet wow that's crazy totally crazy mm -hmm. but trophy brands it's the same reason like we just put mercedes benz mm -hmm. on the market in miami mercedes it's the first mercedes benz residences in the western hemisphere we put it on the market um all of our systems broke they all broke i had to do a zoom presentation to quell everybody i've never experienced anything in my, my life our Zoom broke because I didn't know that you had to have a separate Zoom account for more than 500 people. We had 1,029 buyers show up to my first What was Zoom. it listed? What was it listed at? The whole, it's 791 apartments. Oh, it's okay. It's a whole, whole Miami. Yep. So we started, uh, we sold 100 apartments in four days. Oh, man. And, and it was only 100 because I only I didn't have that many salespeople. I had no, I, I, I had no idea. So trophy brands, right, are always great investments. Every buyer who buys in there We'll be able to flip out of those apartments by time before the time they even close, um, uh, which is insane. Like you can't do that in U.S. real estate. Mm -hmm. That's like a Toronto. Yep. That's like Canada. What's What's the easiest real estate sale you've had? Have you ever, you know, had someone like you? You virtually sold in a webinar. I mean, what's what's sort of been? Yeah, I guess the the quickest one. I mean, ever. selling. I mean, selling those apartments at Mercedes right now. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's the easiest because we're really just processing paperwork. Yeah, we have no physical sales center. Every presentation we do is either in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. Um, and we give everyone 20 minutes. If you waste our time, we literally end the zoom. We do not have the bandwidth, right? So they're moving, they're moving so fast. You have 20 minutes. We'll go through, you pick a unit. you got two days. So 48 hours to sign the contract and 72 hours to wire 20%. Wow. If you cannot do that. We move on to the next person. So I wouldn't say, but it's a ton of work. So I wouldn't say easy. I mean, listen, yeah, I met, I met a guy on a Tuesday. January, 2021, I met him on a Tuesday on the Upper East Side. And it was still COVID, this is pre-vaccine, mm -hmm. masks, stuff. So he wants to rent a place on the Upper East Side. I was like, why? Why are you renting a place on the Upper East Side? It's like, well, I don't know. I feel like I need a place. I'm like, you should buy. You can afford it. You know, I had no idea really how wealthy he is. Um, I was like, you can afford it. New York City's half off. Like 2020 was two days yeah. ago, right? Like New York City is dead. There were that in January 2021, the Red Cross ship was in the Hudson mm -hmm. and there were tents with bodies in Central Park. 
It's like you can get an apartment in New York City right now for 50% off. We had just sold an apartment on 57th Street where the seller was in for 40. We sold it for 16. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's like, oh, I don't know, New York, New York, New York. But then like the salesperson I am, I'm like, okay, what about Florida? He's like, well, send me some stuff. So I sent him some stuff later that day on Tuesday in Miami and Palm Beach. On Wednesday, he's like, yeah, Miami's not for us. Uh, let's go see some things in Palm Beach. I'm like, okay, when do you want to go? It's like, tomorrow. It's like, tomorrow? He's like, yeah, you do Palm Beach, right? Yeah. I'm like, y yes, I do, sort of. Um, by Friday at 5 p.m., we were in contract for a house that was just under $140 million. Jesus. At the time, the most expensive single family home ever sold in the state of Florida. And it was number two in the country next to Jeff Bezos' purchase of his house in Bel Air. Um, Incredible. Good. So I wouldn't say that. I mean, it's easy when I tell the story. Of course. It's like, you know, it's like the whole the lifetime of work that led up to that point, blah, blah, blah. Of course, all of that. Yeah, it's like I'm going to charge you $1,000 to screw yeah. in a light bulb. It's a dollar yeah. for the light bulb. It's $999 to know which one to screw in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, makes a lot of sense. Um, one more question from people because our summit is called the Business of One Summit. A lot of focus is on being independent. How yeah. do you think? Obviously, you have a few, you know, you have your own business now and, you know, people. How do you think a realtor or someone getting into real estate should decide whether to go independent versus not? And you've seen both sides of this now. So I was not independent and then I started my own company. Mm -hmm. I do not think starting your own company is the way to go. I would strongly advise people not do that. Um, if I knew then what I know now, I don't think I would have done it, to be completely honest. It is so hard. It is so mentally draining. And you go from being a great producer, someone who works for themselves, crushing it with big dreams and, oh man, I should go start my own thing, to basically being somebody who only handles problems all day long. Like this podcast right now is a reprieve from my handling of problems today. Welcome to being because, a CEO. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks for telling me. Yeah. It is only issues. I deal with none of the good. Yeah. yeah. No one brings good. me good, good issues. It's yeah. only problems <laughs> so if you want to if you if that's the life you want um and if you want to be sad and lonely start your own company um otherwise be a top producer have a good split pay your damn taxes and just ho go have a great life you know it's the same i asked that same question to like the biggest investment bankers and hedge fund portfolio managers who work at these you know big institutions i'm like man you, you know, and they buy like $50 million apartment. I'm like, why don't you just go start your own thing? Yeah. And they, they give me that answer. Yeah. I'm like, are you kidding me? I make lots of money. I do whatever I want all the time. I crush it. And then all the issues go to that guy. Yes, he has enterprise value only if everything works out perfectly. Mm -hmm. Because if it doesn't, I have the best job at the company and he has the worst. And I was like, mm -hmm. God damn it. <laughs> why didn't anyone tell me this? Awesome. Uh, Ryan, thanks so much for sharing this. I, I feel like we could talk to you for hours, but of course, you've got much to to, to attend to. But we got a, lot I, problems, wanted... a lot of problems. A lot of problems to do with right now. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I want to yeah. just like a huge thank you to, to Ryan in the chat for for sharing this. And like, there's just, I, I highly recommend as well your, your I mean, you got like a, a few books, but um, Sell It Like Sirhan is so good. Um, where is the the best place for people to stay in touch with you if they want to keep digging into the stuff that you're sharing? They want to buy a house from you. Where do they go? Yeah. Email me ryan at sirhant.com best way i mean i'm across all socials and um my newest book is branded like sirhant just came out so if you it's really written for any entrepreneur or solopreneur anyone who wants to build a personal brand or a product brand build a business um it's the last book i'll ever write because they are so hard and take so much time uh so one day it'll be a collector's piece uh, but other than that feel free to email me i'm always i love connecting with with people um hopefully this was sorry sometimes i'm too honest on these things maybe yeah, i should work it. on my sound bites love it nope nope it's better than it's better than a lot of people tend to say the same rehearsed shit it's, it's good to keep it interesting yeah okay well thanks guys awesome. thanks for having me yep great awesome thanks. thanks and we'll see you guys in the next session actually which is in 20 minutes and then our next one will be at uh, 3 p.m pacific 6 p.m eastern um yeah we'll see you guys soon